Hello, and welcome to this CUBE Conversation. I'm Bob LaLiberté, Principal Analyst with theCUBE Research. Today, I'm joined by Anil Singhal, founder and CEO of NetScout, to discuss his new book, The 5% Rule of Leadership, Using Lean Decision-Making to Drive Trust, Ownership, and Team Productivity. Welcome, Anil. Thank you, Bob. So, let's get started. I mean, clearly, you're the co-founder of NetScout. You've been its CEO since its inception over 30 years ago. Uh, pretty impressive tenure, given the research that I've done shows the average CEO's lifespan is about seven to 10 years. Yeah. So more than 30 years is certainly up there with the, with the highest levels, I think, that I've ever seen. Um, it also means that you've seen a lot while you've been at NetScout. You've been there through the roaring 90s into 2000, mm -hmm. the lows of 01, 08. You went through a global pandemic in 2020 and really through all that time, kept the business going, thriving and building. And so it also means that you've learned a lot about leadership and how to lead a company during those times, um, which really brings us to why we're here today, which is to discuss some of those strategies and the rules that you've developed over that time period. Um, and now you want to share with the public. So to get started, I was hoping what you could do is maybe really just define what that 5% rule is and how organizations can benefit from using it. Thank you, Bob, for the time today. And um, so you mentioned about a 30 year span while I was the CEO. So the 5% rule really has stood the test of time. And that's why I want to share with um, uh, not only the leaders within NetScout, but uh, for the other organization. So it's still, but it's still an abstract idea. So I want to maybe just give a couple of examples. So first is, um, you may have heard about the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rules, meaning 20% of the decisions have 80% of the outcomes. But rarely, some people have talked about that uh, the Pareto principle can be applied again to the 20%. And meaning that 5% of the decision could have 95% of the consequences. So I think of 5% rule as that kind of decision making. And, um, and so the way I define that is, uh, is more execution, uh, strategy driven execution versus execution driven strategy. Uh, for example, uh, we do this every day that uh, when we have to go somewhere, and we plan for it. Uh, we don't just go to our garage and start driving. We look at the Google map, we decide, depending on where you are, should I take a train, should I take a Uber, uh, should I, what time I should drive. And, uh, and sometimes we decide to actually postpone the trip. And, um, and all this is, is takes less than 5% of the total effort if, if before execution, which is actually going to the destination. And we all know we almost all the time uh, 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 reach the destination on time. So I look at the 5% rule decision making, spending quality time with the leaders during the first 5% of the project, especially consequential projects, it almost seals the fate of the projects. And then I think we can do flawless execution. Got it, that makes a lot of sense. And it also sounds like you're, you're stepping in up front so you're not having to micromanage the project all the way through. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that a lot of people say, "Is this what's the style of this leader or a manager? Is it a, is he a micromanager or she's a micromanager?" And I believe that micromanagement is not really a leadership style. It's a, it's a necessity. If you have not given clear direction to your team, you have not explain why they are doing it. Just told them the what. You have in effect, not establish that during the first 5% of the project, you'll be forced to actually micromanage. So I think I would look at uh, that we should think about it as more of a, a process and uh, which can be avoided. You don't need to do micromanagement. If you are done uh, your pre-work and front-loaded all the decision during the 5%. Got it. And then to just to hit home for everyone watching, you engage up front, you make those major decisions, let the team run with it, 
Do you come back in at the end or do you let them go through all the way? I think there are checkpoints uh, periodically and certainly toward the end and later on we may go, uh, go over some example of uh, the specific thing we do. But you don't, you are not consistently involved during the execution phase. You are rarely involved. And, uh, but that depends on how good a job you do during the 5%, because if you just do it for the sake of doing it, you don't have all the people involved and you don't drive consensus. You don't describe, you don't agree on the problem you want to solve and how, how you're going to about do, doing it. Then, then, uh, then 5% rule will not be successful. So I say, I think it's a great idea, but you have to make sure you implement it successfully also. Got it. And so when it's implemented successfully, how does that impact the team and the productivity? You've obviously been doing this and you've seen it maybe before and after. I'm curious if you could provide some insights on how it will impact and drive greater productivity. So I talk a lot about goals and outcomes. The goals are explicit and, um, and outcomes are implicit. So the goal is to drive team productivity and all those. But but it really drives efficiencies. I call it lean decision making, and that's enabled by the five percent rule. And um, but it leads to retention. It leads to more collaboration. It makes people more happy about working together. So there are a lot of other outcomes than just the team productivity. I think uh, also I've seen. I mean, it sounds strange, but in for example, for R and D project, I have seen. The five percent rule actually reduces the lines of code you have to write, and if, and so yeah, that's a that's a good goal. Now you can the goal is to finish in time, but lines of code being less automatically finishes less in time. But there are other outcomes, like you'll have less bugs, yeah, uh, less QA time, probably easier to use software. So these are all the good outcomes of that one goal of uh, team productivity. Got it. Yeah, those certainly seem like all valid reasons for why you would want to implement the 5% rule. Yeah. One of the, the anecdotes to make this really concrete for organizations that I found really fascinating in the book was how you applied it to acquisitions and you went about that process. Could you share a little bit with everyone that's watching what the, how, how you implemented the 5% rule as it pertains to an acquisition? So we have, uh, it's interesting, we have done about 10 acquisitions. And in about six or seven, I followed the rules, uh, this rule, but actually for some smaller acquisition, I didn't really do that. And they all resulted in failure, but other seven were uh, wildly successful. So one of the things which we do is that uh, there's a lot of work done upfront before the letter of intent, before even NDA is signed. Uh, and so after our um, VP of strategy says, Anil, we should look at this acquisition, nobody else is involved except that person and me to uh, talk to the other side. It's very frequent that we go out for dinner, establish whether there is a cultural fit, and um, also even talk about price and what is important to them and uh, does it fit Netscout strategy. All this is done most of the time, even without an NDA, which is like very unusual. So we spend a lot of time before the letter of intent. And then, uh, but other uh, traditional ways to start due diligence very early on, halfway or toward the end of diligence, CEO will be called in and say, what do you think? At that time, team has already fallen in love with each other, the two side. It's very hard to say no. And, uh, and they will get all disappointed. So you have tremendous saving up front. And so out, we have done about, uh, like I said, uh, seven successful acquisition, but probably we looked at 50 companies over the last 30 years. And so imagine those 40 plus never went through the diligence phase. And what a great saving in time and effort it was. And so that's, uh, that's actually a very good example. And like I said, in our own company, when there were small acquisition, we said we don't really need to do it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it, it all turned into uh, failures. We lost all the people. Um, one of the unique things about NetScout is 50% of the management team in NetScout 
VP and above are from acquired companies, which is very unusual because people, when they sell their company, they generally live. Okay. But here, uh, I look at uh, people as intellectual property. So uh, this is one of the criteria that if the people we are, uh, the company we're trying to acquire, if the big, uh, most of the key people don't want to stay, and then with their, that that um, sort of option is fouled out right in the beginning. But so doing making this decision earlier and earlier stages of life results in a lot of good productivity if you move forward, but avoid wastage also if you don't want to move forward. Correct. Yeah, I was thinking that as well. It's, it eliminates so many distractions yeah. that happen when organizations are doing acquisitions and so forth. So that certainly would be of huge value. One of the other things you talked about in the book was around um, being a problem solver, not a solution provider. I was wondering if you could touch upon how the 5% rule impacts that. Sure. So during the 5% rule, there are a lot of techniques I talk about in the book, uh, which, are, which I use to successfully implement the 5% rule. And problem solver versus solution provider is one. That means that you will need to understand the why of the solution you want to build. And uh, you need to, for that, you have to first understand the problem. So there is a, I commonly use a phrase, are you asking, answering questions from the customer? Or are, are you answering, uh, solving their problem? So what's the difference? The difference is when customer says, I have these requirements, they have, have, they have not really explained why they, don't, they have the requirement. So they try to go back to the customer or quick boy to the, go back to the leadership during the five person. Why are you doing this? What problem we are trying to solve? And I have typically found there is a lot of argument in various meetings and uh, there's disconnect on how we should do something. And then you realize they're actually trying to solve slightly different problem. Everyone wants to drive, drive growth, but they might want to do it differently. And as a result, it takes long, long time to get consensus because problem definition is typically a few pages long. But the solution definition could be 100 pages long. So if you want to drive consensus and you have to do it in 5% time, not you yeah, don't have infinite time, you better focus on problem. And a lot of time you redefine the problem. In fact, um, not driving uh, after looking at Google Map, is saying, well, I don't want to solve this problem right now. And actually, you fall, solve the problem by not going there. Correct. Yep, absolutely. So one of the other things in the book that I found really interesting was the importance that you placed on decision-making and the ability to have good decision-makers versus expertise. Yeah. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of your thoughts on, on looking to hire people with great decision-making skills. Yeah. So I think it's important that um, as a leader uh, that uh, domain knowledge and expertise is less important. You can acquire it. You can count on your team to do this. But somebody has to make the decision and do it in time. And in the 5% rule, is even more important. So I look at, um, when I look at um, interviews, especially the managers, VP and above, and and um, we have found most of the successful managers in NetScout are very good in decision making, driving consensus, and uh, rather than doing micromanagement and and dealing with uh, productivity later on during the execution phase. Yeah, good. Now another thing, this is something I've had personal experience as an analyst working with NetScout over a number of years, competed against you for a while. Um, but the culture that you've created and the value system yeah. is fairly unique there. So I'm, I'm wondering what advice would you give for other leaders who are looking at starting or changing their corporate culture around creating the value system for a corporation? Uh, good question, Bob. So this is very, very important to me and we actually talk about in the very beginning of the book that when we start a company, okay, we typically look at what product we are going to develop, who we are going to compete with, uh, what kind of people I want to hire, and um, uh, and how we are going to sell the product, but more importantly, how are we are going to get funding. And But people are not really talking about values, what value system you want to have. Like in Netscode, we decided that 
everyone will have the same classes of share and um and uh, fairness and trust will be the at the center of this and so we fic- we spend a lot of time on establishing those values and we have uh, this five tenets of our high ambition leadership which has morphed slightly but the underlying message has not changed since the 90s and uh, that has led to great retention i mean we have uh, average retention at netscout is 20 plus years and um and so we we focus on different things like base salaries versus bonus versus benefit versus stock and i think it has uh, i think it has delivered great a uh, great value like i said it stood uh, the test of time so this was in a way the 5% decision also or uh, before starting a company in addition to those traditional thing we do we have added this new thing uh which is the value system and i think that uh, that's a great multiplier as you move along and probably that's one of the reason uh for the long tenure of the company got it, got it. yeah you mentioned in there that fairness at the heart of the company yeah. and so forth do you have an example of how that manifests itself so uh, that's another interesting topic so i mentioned earlier that that you have goals and outcome so there is a lot of talk in the industry about transparency but i believe transparency is an outcome not a goal because if you just make it a explicit goal you'll be pretending to do that so what drive transparency i believe is fairness so as an example in netcode everyone is on a same bonus calculation formula formula whether it's a receptionist or all the way up to me you know, all all levels of the organization in our building uh in westford headquarter all the offices are of the same size including mine and um everyone is eligible for rs user stocks and that creates a transparency because i can just do a presentation to the entire company otherwise somebody say why are you showing me the power of the stocks or benefit when i don't have it so it creates the ultimate transparency because there's nothing to hide because fairness uh, is leads to transparency transparency is outcome uh, not uh, not necessarily a goal fairness is the goal but once you have a good goal like that it has other benefits like simplicity not only i can be transparent but i can do one presentation for the entire company and it's so simple it saves time is productive productivity and uh, so i call it even that a lean decision making because look at the number of outcomes you have transparency simplicity uh, time saving um, retention all because of fairness and uh, fairness is not just it at all levels north south east west at all levels and 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 we we try to do that and then actually we are very fair with the customers they are fair with us also so it it uh, it it's very addictive. Yeah, I I bet. And like I said, I I've, I've worked with your company for a long time. I've met a lot of those employees who've been there 15, 20 years. Yeah. And you can see that they're bought in to the culture. Yeah. And I talk to them not looking for job, they're not trying to yeah. see where they can get something yeah. better. They're very happy. So, I mean, ultimately you're talking about implementing this rule that permeates throughout the entire yeah. company that drives I think a lot of not only productivity and crisp decision making, yeah. but also fosters i think organize oh, the employees to be happy where they are yeah. and to then obviously that them being happy and satisfied will then yeah. reflect on the customers and overall the value i think you had mentioned earlier that there were booms and bust in last 30 yeah. years and this is one thing which is not doesn't change like covid was a non event at netscore right. and because we were doing those things taking care of things before covid so in that sense it was not a uh, a a big event like in other places excellent now that's great well i think that's probably all the time we have today so uh anil thank you so much for coming down and and sharing a lot of this great advice for the leaders looking to build uh not only an enduring company but also one with a great culture as well um you know um it's also important to note that while you create and follow that 5% rule it's also leveraged at all levels at netscout and management 
Um, so if you would like to learn more about the 5% rule of leadership that has just come out, the book is now available on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble. So please reach out, get your own copy and get the details behind what we discussed today. This is Bob Lau Liberté from the Cube Research. Thank you for watching this Cube conversation with Anil Singhal of NetScout on the 5% rule of leadership. Thank you, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.